Most people already use the template method programming pattern even if they don't know that that's what it's called. In fact, it's probably been used in half the videos on this channel, so explaining the pattern itself is only going to take a few minutes. Where it really starts to shine is when you start using the methods as hooks, and we're going to talk about something that's very important to remember when using this pattern, and that's how to keep from violating the Liskov substitution principle, one of the least understood of the solid principles. Let's go. Let's start with a demonstration of the problem that this pattern solves. Let's suppose we're starting to create a base class for all of the enemies in our game. They could all use or overwrite a method called attack. Now in our game, maybe we have a sequence of events that have to happen during an attack. Maybe the enemy has to move a little bit closer to the player, then perform its attack, and then move back to its position in the lineup. Now this by itself is almost the template method programming pattern, but this has some problems. For example, if we create a goblin that inherits from enemy, we could override the attack method. Then, in order to execute the attack sequence, we would call base.attack. And then after that's complete, we could run any additional logic we want. For now, we can just debug a statement. Already here, we can see one of the first problems. If we make another enemy and we call it archer, and I just forget to call the base attack class, then none of the algorithm from the base class will ever get executed. We're only going to see the new logic that's introduced in this class. Furthermore, even if I'm doing it this way and I remember to call the base method every time, I can only add more steps to the end of the original algorithm. Our base attack method really has three different steps to it, and we want to execute those three steps in the same order every time. So let's take a look at how the template method pattern solves this problem. First of all, let's mark this base enemy class as abstract. We're going to keep our attack method as a public method, but this time it's not going to be virtual or abstract. It's going to be a concrete set of steps that clearly define our algorithm for attacking the player. So we're going to approach the player in one method, the next method will perform our attack, and the third method will be to move back into the lineup. Now it could be that all of our enemies are going to approach the player in the same manner. So we could just have a private method here that does the implementation for that. We could do exactly the same thing for retreat. Maybe they all retreat in exactly the same way. However, where they're probably different is in the perform attack. So here we make an abstract method so that all the classes that inherit from enemy must implement this method. Now when we inherit from enemy, we don't need to worry about calling the base class. We don't need to worry about the sequence of the algorithm. We just need to implement the custom functionality that we want for this enemy. So that's the template method pattern in a nutshell. It defines the skeleton of an algorithm in the base class, and it lets the subclasses override specific steps that you want without changing the algorithm's structure. Now you've probably noticed this kind of pattern being used, especially in the build method of the builder programming pattern, because often we'll need to assemble something that we're building and then call specific methods on it to get things initialized. And sometimes those have to happen in a specific sequence. Now we can also draw some comparisons to the strategy programming pattern. Strategy lets you modify behavior using composition, whereas template method lets you modify behavior using inheritance. So let's move on to the concept of hooks. If we were to come back up into the base class and change this abstract method to instead be a virtual method, we no longer have to enforce anything in the subclasses. Overriding this method becomes optional, and in fact we can do that for every step in our algorithm. Now we have something much more flexible and powerful. The sequence of the algorithm will always be executed the same way, and our subclasses will always have some default behavior unless we override the methods. In the most extreme case, you might want to have an enemy that actually does nothing. We could call it passive enemy, then all we have to do is override each of the methods with a no-op implementation. It just does nothing. For all intents and purposes, this has now become the null object programming pattern. So keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily have to apply to enemies, but to any kind of algorithm you have in your project. So at this point, you should have a fairly good grasp on the pattern itself. But let's talk about the Liskov substitution principle. This principle basically says that subclasses should behave like their parent class so that the code using them doesn't break or act differently. I think the easiest way to see this is to actually make a violation of the principle. If we make another enemy here that implements the perform attack method, but instead of actually doing anything, 
or at least doing what it is supposed to do, it throws some kind of exception. Now, these kinds of violations come in other ways too. It could return an unexpected value or it could silently do nothing. But in some way, it's going to cause the code that works with the parent class to break or behave incorrectly when it's using this subclass. Let's look at an example. Let's suppose that we're working with a list of enemies. In our start method, we might start populating this list with maybe the goblin, and we can add a dummy enemy where we know that it's going to throw an exception in its perform attack method. If we were to iterate over all of these enemies and call the public attack method on each of them, we know that at the second element in the list, it's going to fail. Now, throwing an exception breaks the program immediately. It's obvious and easy to catch. But if you have a subclass that behaves incorrectly while still being programmatically valid, this is much more dangerous because it silently violates expectations and causes logical bugs that are harder to find. Let's consider a different example. For the sake of this example, let's introduce another step into our template method algorithm. We'll call this calculate damage. Calculate damage will return an integer of some value. Maybe we could introduce this right after the perform attack step. Now, let's make an assumption here that we want calculate damage to always return some kind of positive number. At least that's how we've decided that damage is going to work in our game, and everybody working on the game agrees that's how it's going to be done. However, we decide that we're going to introduce a healer enemy. So we create a new class that inherits from enemy, and we must implement the calculate damage step. But this enemy, instead of damaging the player, is going to heal the player. So we decide to be clever and just return a negative amount of damage. We're doing an inverse amount of damage, so that's really the equivalent of a heal, right? Well, that's true, but semantically, that's not correct. We're not actually doing damage to the player anymore. Being semantically correct means that your code not only compiles and runs, but it behaves exactly the way other parts of the program expect it to, so that developers, including future you, can safely trust the system without constantly second guessing which each class and what each method is actually doing. This method is not calculating damage anymore. And in fact, you could argue that the enemy is not performing an attack either. What they're really doing is performing some kind of action. A better approach to have a variety of enemies like this is to implement interfaces so that you make it clear what behaviors each class promises to support. Enemies might be able to execute a variety of actions, so we could have an interface called iAction that has one method execute. Now we can clearly and semantically distinguish between a damage action and any other kind of action that we want. So a damage action might retain some information about the amount of damage. It could have a constructor where we set that amount, then its execute method could apply some damage to the player. Likewise, we could have a heal action that does almost exactly the same thing, but semantically it makes sense, and instead of applying damage to the player, it applies a heal to the player. Back in our enemy class, we keep a reference to this action, and we can also keep a reference to our player target. We could have some kind of initialized method where we actually set the type of action for each enemy, so in our healer enemy class, we would just set that action to be a new heal action for some amount. Or even better, you would just pass in the action pre-configured. You can probably see that we're beginning to combine template method with the strategy programming pattern. Now, where we were performing an attack, instead we're just going to execute that action on our target. And in fact, I would go further than that and say we're going to rename this method perform attack to be perform action. And then our actual template method that defines the algorithm could be renamed to something better like execute or take turn, whatever it might be. In this manner, you end up with something that's not only programmatically correct, but it's semantically correct as well and is gonna make sense down the road. So don't forget that template method applies to a lot more than just the enemy example that I gave today. It lets you guarantee the sequence of your algorithm, but gives you the freedom to change the behavior of each step. So that's where we'll wrap it up for this week. Feel free to join us on Discord. There's going to be another asset giveaway very soon. Hit the subscribe button if you want to catch another video like this every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.